And now what are you charged with the same as your first case? Well, no, the, the Canadians don't like uh, uh, shooting policemen. So as you probably, I think you have the same rule in, in UK. If I shoot you in the leg, that might be assault with a deadly weapon or aggravated. What, what's the term? Don't know exactly. But if I shoot a policeman in the leg, that's attempted murder. So because it's a policeman, they always lift up the seriousness one level. So it was a charge of attempted murder. So you're in a remand jail in Canada. What was that like? Well, it was, uh, I, uh, you know, the, this, the same sort of what dynamics hold true. I mean, in Canada, the good part, of course, is that most people are white. So you don't have so much of the racial stuff. But unfortunately, I, I had one of these racial experiences almost like two hours since I was put in the, you know, oh. in the jail because I got let on this tier. And as I walked into the tier, I noticed that the first two cells had two Indians in them. And the third cell had an Indian, and he was gunning me off as I came in, looking evilly at me. And I had bad feeling about this, but I didn't know him, so I ignored him. And I went to my cell. And when I went to make my bed, I lifted it up, and there was a big pool of blood under the mattress. And I'm in there, and all of a sudden, this white kid comes running into the cell. And he says, they're going to get me next. They're going to get me next. And I said, what? What are you talking about? He said, the Indians, they, they broke that guy's arm and they fucked him up and that's his blood and they're going to get me next. And I said, why? He said, well, they made me play cards with him and, and I lost. And they said, I have to pay them a carton of cigarettes or my, my, my visitor has to bring, give them the money or whatever it was. And so two hours <laughs> coming into this cell, there's already this drama is happening. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, well, I'm going to have to school this boy. And so he's, he's not a Caucasian anymore. He becomes a good white boy. So I said to him, look, I said, there's only one way out of this. You got to show some heart. So you just, you just run into that guy's cell and give him your best shot. Just hit him as hard as you can. But when you run out, run right. Because I was like back this way on the left-hand side. And he says, okay. I said, but he's looking a bit nervous. I said, I said, seriously, I said, if you don't do this, I'm not gonna help you. You're on your own. So I, I come out and I'm looking at the, the there's a TV behind over the screen, and then there's a TV, and there's in Canada, everybody watches hockey games. So I'm not you know, into hockey, but it was the only thing that was on. So I'm pretending to look at the hockey game. And this kid doesn't hit the guy. He walks in with his coffee, hot coffee, and throws it in the guy's face. And this Indian's big. He's like 6'2", about 190 pounds. And he just roars and comes barreling out of the cell after this guy. And this kid's only, you know, whatever it is, 5'6", and a little guy. Anyway, the Indian comes out of the cell. I hook him around the neck, kick out his legs. Bam, he goes on the ground. Stomp on his jaw a couple of times. He starts screaming. As soon as he starts screaming, the guards come. But the kid suddenly recovers his balls, and he comes running in to put the boots on this guy. So I just go back into my cell, sit down, and the kids putting their boots to him with proper enthusiasm, and the guards see it and they take them both away. And the that, kids, he's so happy, right? He's got the heart on a mountain lion <laughs> all of a sudden. Um, are you trained in martial arts? <sighs> Not really, but you know, there's there's different moves you can make. I mean, basically, I'll tell you a story. This is a San Quentin story. One of these guys was released on the determinant sentencing. So there was no, he just was released. One day he's on the main line of San Quentin. The other day he walks out onto the street in San Francisco. Now he's a hardcore racist and he's, there's no halfway house, no pro parole, no nothing. There he is. And he walks down the street and he sees this beautiful white girl, with long blonde hair, walking with a black. And he walks over and he says, you fucking nigga, right? And, well, you know, I mean, the, the black guy, though, is cool. He looks at him and he says, I'm rated number three in Taekwondo. No, eh, was it Taekwondo? I don't remember now. In California, which in California is pretty significant. Before he can even finish the sentence, the guy just puts blade right in his heart. 
What the hell? Because it doesn't matter how much martial arts you know. If you live in a middle class society, you're not jungle instinct hot. Yeah. If you're on the San Quentin mainline, your instincts are like wild animal instincts. Yeah. You see each movement. You see who's doing what. What's he doing? How's he standing? Like this guy standing here, he's not threatening me. It's, it's okay. Mm -hmm. You're sitting in the chair. You're looking around. What's a weapon? What is it? Mm -hmm. And that guy killed him. One shot to the heart mm -hmm. before the, the Taekwondo guy can even finish his warning, right? So the things calm down in the jail in Canada now, or does it keep? Well, no, I, unfortunately, I went to the maximum. And it's called Kent Maximum. And uh, yeah. it was like a, it was like San Quentin, except there were only 150 guys. This is, this is prior to sentencing? Is no, it? no, this is, this is after sentencing. Okay, got, so how long were you on remand before you got sentenced? It was about four months, I think. Something four like months. That. And what is your new sentence? Oh, I've got a, one interesting tale to tell you. Um, I go up, because this gunfight happened way off in the mountains in Canada, I go up to that little town to the county court and there's my trial. Anyway, I, I'm leg shackled, handcuffed, and I get put into the waiting room, um, you know, beside the courtroom and the police are standing outside. And guess who's sitting beside me on the bench? The big Indian. And he doesn't have any handcuffs. Or leg shackles. Oh. He's sitting there right beside me, and I'm handcuffed and leg shackled. And I thought to myself, um. I'm in for a beating here. <laughs> this boy, he knows it's me, and he's going to give it to me for sure, because he's got nothing to lose, right? And I I just don't know what I'm going to do, because they've, they've shackled me to a belt, like hand shackled to a belt, plus leg shackled. So the best I could do would be to roll up in a ball, I suppose, and just kind of wiggle around on the floor. And he looks at me, and the biggest cheese-eating grin, he says, I got some Hank books. You want to read some Hank books? And he was as friendly as pie. He was offering me cigarettes. And, and I thought to myself, this is really strange. I couldn't figure it out. And then I realized we were taken into court and he was charged with raping a minor, some 13-year-old mm. girl. Mm. And he realized that I was in the courtroom with him. You were a witness. I was a witness to what he really was in for. Mm. And so his, like, ultra macho bullying and fucking up these white guys was obviously a play to make himself look tough. And But now I had the goods on him. Yep. And he was trying to trying so hard to be nice, right? Anyway, I, I go back to the remand center, and the same kid was there. And I said, "You'll be interested in this." And I told him the tale, and boy, you know, the posse was out after this guy after that. Right? Really? Because yeah. in Canada, of course, they have the same hatred of child molesters and such like. I think it's universal. Yeah. All right. So, what was your sentence then? I had a ten-year sentence. And how much do you have to serve on that in Canada? Well, yeah, the mandatory release is two thirds. They can, however, you go in front of the parole board after on that about three years and three months. So one third, you go in front of the parole board. I did the full mandatory. So. And which prison did you end up at? Well, I was in Kent to begin with, and Kent was the maximum. And in Canada. In, in the West Coast, in British Columbia, they have a different demography. They don't have the racial problem because everybody's most everybody's white. Some Indians, but most everybody's white. The problem in Canada is in the West Coast, there's just an amazing number of drug addicts. So the prison is filled with drug addicts. Now, drug addicts make about the worst prisoners in the world because they combine being sleazy with being weak, with ratting people out easily, with being selfish and greedy, and I mean they don't they haven't taken on the convict ethos, put it that way. So it I felt like I had really fallen backwards in terms of the 
the, the people you were sharing your space with. To be honest, I'd rather be around bank robbers and, you know, people like that than drug addicts. Was it much less violent than California, though? Well, interestingly enough, it was pretty violent. Was it? Um, because they, in Canada, it's, Canada doesn't have the gun crime that America has, even though they have the same number, I mean, of guns held by people. But Canada does have a pretty violent subculture. So Canadians play ice hockey. And ice hockey is basically um, assault with bodily harm as a sport. I don't know if you've ever watched it. Yeah, yeah. Canadian ice hockey is, uh, and so there was um, there was also another level is that the worst criminals from Quebec would be sent to the West Coast. Now Quebec has a serious underworld culture. We're talking anything that that New York has, Chicago has, Montreal has. The same level of you know mob assassinations and you know organized crime and but Quebec is particularly famous for high powered robbery, armored car robberies, with machine guns and all that kind of stuff. And so those kind of guys, they didn't want them in Quebec. So in California we called it bus therapy. So you move somebody away from where they're familiar. So they would in Canada they'd move people from Quebec all the way out to the West Coast where they knew nobody, and that way they hoped to, you know, take them away from their roots and from their support. But those boys were dangerous, and so I knew a an English guy actually, a dope addict, dope thief, and he had just he'd made some move on one of these Quebec kids. He cheated him out of something like I. He, he got a cuff of drugs from him and then didn't pay him. And the Quebecois just stabbed him right away. I mean, as soon as he didn't pay, he didn't have the money, he just pulled the knife out and stabbed him. And this English guy was just standing there, almost died. And he was just stunned. He stabbed me, he stabbed me. And he didn't understand, because for him, that kind of move in the Vancouver dope, dope world was just run-of-the-mill everyday activity. You stiff other addicts and they stiff you and... To steal each other's stashes and whatever. But for those guys, they played by San Quentin rules. So, so it, it was a dangerous place. I mean, it, this American guy had, like me, escaped and jumped the border, got in a shootout with the police there in Saanich. But unfortunately, he, he could only, he had a 410 shotgun with birdshot. So he shot the policeman with birdshot. But all that did is make him angry. So when they had him cuffed, they had him on the ground, and the policeman's partner came up, put his pistol to his head, and pulled the trigger. Now this American, luckily, when the gun went to his head, he shifted his head by 45 degrees, and it just blew out the skull and eye orbit, and he lost his eye, but he didn't die. And they, they put his head back together, but it was like a, a teacup that had been glued. You know, they had pins and things, and he couldn't take a, a shot to the head. He was, and so they put him in the maximum. And unfortunately for this guy, he had a disconnect in his head between who he was now and who he had been. He had been a hope to die gangster, an escape convict, and all the rest. But now he was essentially a cripple. And that disconnect caused what came next. The dope addicts, the dope fiends were watching him and they knew he had some smoke. So they robbed his stash. And he found they robbed his stash. And so he went and put, if you can believe this, he put a sign on the bulletin board saying, I know who did it and you'll get yours. <sighs> now, it's one thing you do in the joint is you never threaten anybody. You either do it or keep quiet. But what you don't do is broadcast that you're going to do it. So he went and did this. And so the dope fiends, they got, they, they, know, they knew this guy who was an out, outright psycho. This guy had beaten an old woman to death because she complained about his deaf, deaf leopard music or something like that. Anyway, he was in there. 
And all he did was just point him in this guy's direction. And he ran in with a weight bar and he broke the guy's arms and broke his legs and then whacked him in the skull, shattered his skull again. So I wouldn't say that prison was particularly peaceful. 